I'm Morgan. And I'm Megan. Twins and hosts of Eminem Chat, a monthly podcast that brings together our many commonalities. Motherhood, firm life, fitness, chasing our passions, and go chat. It is our goal to create a show that is positive, real, and fun. Hey guys, welcome back to our second episode of 2024. Today, our conversation will be all about things postpartum. So we found a couple articles that we are going to be discussing and just um, kind of diving into this topic and using those to guide our conversation. And we also plan to add a little bit about our own postpartum journey into our conversation today. Um, we know that sometimes there's a lot of information out there and then sometimes you feel like there's not enough about postpartum and you might have some questions and um, we still have some questions too and that we're diving into this. And so it's just, I feel like it's good to have um, things that you can listen to uh, about things that you're going through. So if you are about ready to enter a postpartum journey, or maybe you've already been through one, but it's nice to feel like you can relate to other people and know that there's a lot of us going through this or a lot of us um, who have questions and different things like that. So we're just going to have a have a conversation today about it. And I'm looking forward to uh, discussing it with you, Morgan. And also Morgan's about ready to go on her second round of being postpartum. You guys, she is going to be having a baby within the next week. <laughs> yes. So this was really timely. Um, Megan and I were talking about it. Uh, a couple weeks ago, and Megan is um, now two years into the postpartum journey, but I feel like there's like, they call it like the fourth trimester, but really like fourth, second, third trimester has a date on the calendar when it transitions to the next um, trimester. And I feel like with postpartum, like when is kind of like that You're stage, not in postpartum like, anymore. You're not really postpartum <laughs> anymore, but you still kind of feel like you have symptoms your body's still kind of changing or going back kind of readjusting to like how maybe how you were before and then not exactly how you were before so Megan was actually talking to me about this a little bit the other day and I was like that would be a really good topic for the podcast because I'm about to go on like you said round two and you're two years now postpartum and I'm three years postpartum from Dean and but we still have side effects so we still have like things that pop up that will like is this normal? Is this how you feel? And so I agree. It's going to be a fun conversation just to talk about all the things today. So we have like one article that we're going to highlight. And then we found some like quick bites for the end of the conversation. But the article is from the first one is from um, it's called well plus good. And it goes through more of like mindset. So we're going to talk about that one a little bit. Uh, but then we're going to kind of just take our own pieces of it uh, because mental health was a big component of this first article. And while we do want to talk about mental health and some things that we went through, we didn't experience it as to the degree as some people. And so we don't want to spend too much time on that when we're not real familiar with certain aspects of postpartum mental health. So we added in some other things that we want to cover as well. So this first quote from Well and Good um, says, the current standard of postpartum care in the country includes just one checkup at the six-week mark after giving birth, which nearly every survey, statistic, and study on the topic suge suggests that that's insufficient. Uh, and that really stood out to me. Out of the whole article, that quote probably really hit me the hardest because our bodies change so much and we're the ones carrying the babies. And then when you have the baby, we go in for one appointment postpartum. And then if everything's good and routine, they're like, thumbs up, see you in yeah. a year. And then, but your newborn baby goes for like quite a few, a handful of appointments from the time they're born to the time they're a year. Yeah, I was looking on Google of just like, what is the most common uh, practice for doctors to take, like look at babies and do their checkups it says the most common is at birth three to five days after birth one month uh, two months four months six months nine months 12 months 15 18 and 24 months so that's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven appointments within the first two years of them being born which like as a mom you you want them to go get that 
check up and make sure that they're on track and make sure they're meeting the milestones that they should be meeting or make sure that they're growing and getting um, vaccines, gaining enough weight and things like that. So you want them to, but it's amazing how we uh, focus on all of those appointments when also our bodies have changed so much and we have one appointment. So we should be having maybe not that many, but we should still be having a couple more appointments, I feel like. And you can schedule more appointments. Um, I've been hearing a lot more people talk about going to see a pelvic floor uh, therapist or um, a specialist or doing different things to help with your postpartum recovery. Lactation consultants, helping with nursing, just those, uh, those experts out there to help with some of these postpartum changes. But if you don't have the connections or you didn't realize they were available until after the fact, it doesn't do you much good. And also you have to be willing to take the time to go and see those people. And who knows if your insurance covers it or not. So I feel like it isn't as common. And a lot of times people, women kind of just put it off or neglect it. Mm -hmm. Like you've been talking about the fact the last three years that you've been wanting to maybe go see a pelvic floor um, specialist and you haven't yet. Because work is busy, taking time off is hard. Um, Finding a babysitter. Yeah, yeah. So I definitely feel like it's starting to become more oh, people are aware of what's out there, but it's still not common enough. And people are maybe using the, them, using the resources to the max that they should be. And even us, we're not using them as well as we should be. I'm definitely um, going to try to implement some pelvic floor therapy but like you said it's classified under PT or physical therapy so um thankfully my doctor is very open to those type of uh help and extra support because he's like even with the c-section I was kind of afraid so uh, you guys if um I guess we never really talked about that yet but for Dean I had a vaginal birth and for this baby I'm planning on having a C-section because he's breached. And I was kind of nervous because I was supposed to start pelvic floor therapy uh, while I was pregnant because they said it's actually good to like walk those muscles even while you're pregnant to like help support. So like when I sneeze, I don't pee. And as I get bigger, uh, when I cough, I don't <laughs> pee and stuff like that. But then I ended up having placenta previa where the placenta planted itself and and in the front of the cervix so you can't do pelvic floor therapy so they said I'd have to wait till I was postpartum so I asked my doctor the other day I was like since I'm having a scheduled c-section like will you still write a recommendation for pelvic floor therapy because I still would like to try it from Dean and he's like oh yeah yeah oh, I'll still yeah. He, he's like, I'll still write you a doctor's note to like get that because otherwise, like you said, insurance won't cover it if the doctor doesn't recommend it or prescribe it. Mm. And lactation consulting is another one where a lot of times it's not covered by insurance because they're like, like they just assume we should have it figured out, I guess, even though we've never breastfed, we've never yeah. done this. But it's not seen as always necessary. And I'm like, how is it not necessarily? You're feeding your child and yeah. we've never done this before. Right. And it's even just the understanding of like you get the like women get the concept of how to do it. But it's even finding the right like phalange sizes for your breast pump or um, just different like even different types of breast pumps, like what works best with you or if you're going to do a hand pump or or if you are just strictly going to breastfeed and because you're at home, there's just different scenarios for everybody. And so you might just have questions like, I think I was using the wrong um, like nipple size when I was using my pump. And it took me a while to figure out the right size. And I could have probably mm -hmm. saved a lot of headache, even a lot of clogged ducts, a lot of different situation, like a situational pain <laughs> that I probably could have prevented if I went and saw somebody or even got a little bit of help even more while I was at the hospital because a consultant did come in and talk to me while I was at the hospital, especially because I was there for four days. So I had yeah. a little bit of time, but I probably could have requested them to come in a little bit more versus just once or twice and been like, I really need more help with this. And instead, I just didn't want to be a bother. And I'm like, they probably mm -hmm. have more patients to see. And we can't feel like a bother. We have to be willing to advocate for ourselves. That's another thing that, um, something on our list that we wanted to talk about was maternity leave 
And I'm nervous about that because you being a teacher and, and knowing your experience from Andrew, uh, finding someone to cover for you while you're pumping at school can be a challenge. And I want to make sure I advocate for myself. But I also have been feeling guilty now with like, if someone needs to cover me for 30 minutes because I need to leave early to go to an appointment, mm-hmm. then when I come back from my 20 leave, oh, well, now I have. I want to try to pump twice a day. So if it doesn't line up with like my lunch or my prep, like, am I going to have to have someone come in and cover or am I going to just wait till my next thing? But then you said, don't do that because like it can mess up your milk supply if you Mm -hmm. wait too long. And so it's like, I want to be able to advocate for myself, but then you also like, there's a shortage of subs of covers Mm -hmm. and you feel guilty and your class also likes if you're gone for 15, 20 minutes of your class, a lot of times, like, are they getting behind because you're not there? And they're probably just doing like a study hall while the cover's in there. So there's just all these things to think about because you're not going to plan sub notes for 15 minutes each day when someone comes in to cover for you. Yeah, yeah, that is hard. And you also want to make sure that you're being like you're still taking priority in your profession. So it's like motherhood and family and that kind of stuff is very high priority and I would argue should be higher priority than your career but your career is so important and you still want to do good at your job and you want you're there to help the kids learn so you there is that guilt conscious of like you feel guilty because you don't want to and you don't want to make somebody else come in and cover either that is hard as a teacher because you know that they're busy and they have a job Mm -hmm. to do and so it's that battle of I want to advocate for myself but I also want to do my job And I also want to do it well, because last year when I was doing it, it's like they were more than willing to cover for me, but I was brand new in the position and I just felt better taking control over like my class and doing it instead of like trying to figure out, yeah, like what to leave for the sub or um, someone coming in to cover for 20 minutes. And so it is tough, I feel like. (laughs) Well, and uh, it's actually like, it's kind of crazy that it's a, it's, it's like to the point where it's actually like helping me or not helping, I guess helping is not the right word, but like determining how long I plan to breastfeed. So like with Dean, I breastfed for like seven months and then my body just actually decided it was done. And with this baby, I'm like, well, maybe my body might decide when it's done too. But if it doesn't, should I just breastfeed and stuff up until the end of summer and go back to school next fall? He'll be like six months old at that time. Like, should then I transition to formula because of going from summer back to school and then like starting a new year? Like, am I going to request for someone to cover for me again come fall? But then it's like formula costs a lot and stuff. Mm -hmm. And like, what if my body does prolong it this time and and it doesn't decide to be done at seven months like what if I could theoretically go till nine months or ten months with this baby so so it's like am I really gonna allow like not being able to find someone to cover for me when they have to allow someone to cover for me because of like guilt and stuff like that like am I going to shorten my journey of breastfeeding and stuff because of like because of my job yeah so it's just thoughts and like yeah all the things that um you don't really think about until it's happening and then you're like well now what do I do (laughs) yeah what I've also been thinking about um the fact that both of you and I both kind of ended our breastfeeding journey because our bodies kind of decided but I feel like our bodies decided because of like external factors and like being maybe stressed or not being able to or like not having the right materials like not knowing what pump we no, how to my use pump the pump was or... like way out of whack yeah and I feel like because I mean I don't want to compare us to animals but like I'm going to anyways because that's what we know by living on the farm like if you think about a cow a cow will keep breastfeeding a oh, breastfeeding <laughs> a cow will keep <laughs> nursing <laughs> there we go a cow will keep nursing the baby literally until you wean them yeah like we had a heifer that was still nursing off of the cow at two years old at three wasn't yeah. she was she three years old I don't know we had to put a bull ringer on her because yeah. she wouldn't quit yeah 
And I know that she had another calf as well. So like she reproduced that milk probably, but a, an animal will keep producing milk as long as the baby's drinking. Mm-hmm. You would think humans would be the same way, but maybe we just need that support and that extra help. Or it's the external stressors, the things that are causing our milk supply to go down or even our nutrition. Our nutrition could be causing our milk supply to go down as well. So it's like knowledge is power and just kind of thinking about that. Yeah. And being the second time around too, like the fourth time around, I just remember this is one of our next topics is sleeping. And I really struggled with the lack of sleep. Like I was, I just remember being exhausted and I'm nervous this time around because I feel like um, I'm more tired now as a full-time teacher and growing the flower and farm business and having a toddler and then being pregnant and having a new baby on the way. Like I thought I was tired then, like it was a different kind of tired and like (laughs) not trying to. Every heart is hard. (laughs) Every heart is hard, but I feel like I'm just like, how can I like add another like thing on my plate? Like I'm almost nervous about that and like getting up in the middle of the night again because Dean's been, I mean, he wakes up every once in a while, but he's a good sleeper and he has been since he was little. Like for the most part, he actually has been sleeping through the night since he was four months old, besides like regressions. And so people when listening I was, to this that have babies that don't sleep. Well. <laughs> yeah. I'll like jealous. Like, and what? Being, like, what are you complaining about then? You should yeah. have plenty of sleep. Uh, <laughs> but I remember when I first brought him home from the hospital. I would wake up in the middle of the night to feed him and stuff, but then I wouldn't pump two in the middle of the night when he like didn't need me. And I think that also, like you said, knowledge is power because I was like, well, I, I even remember Tyler being like, well, Dean hasn't waken up for a couple hours. Should you get up and pump anyways? Because I would be like TMI, but like leaking really everywhere full. being like full. And he, I, I would be like, well, he hasn't woken up. Like I just want to sleep. Um, and so I think because of that, though, I did lose some of my supply because the demand, my body was like, oh, the demand's not there. If I would have been pumping that extra a little bit, one, I would have filled up the freezer better. But two, yeah. my body would have been like, oh, we need this. Yeah. Uh, so this time around, I'm going to and watch. But also, like like I said, Dean's been sleeping since he was sleeping mostly through the night since he was like four months old, besides those sleep regressions. And I'm like, just because Dean was a good sleeper doesn't mean this baby, like, yeah, this baby might wake up every hour. So I'm also preparing myself for that, too, because sleep was one of the most challenging things for me. And I had a good sleeper. Yeah, yeah. Um, I agree with you. Sleep is hard just because you're in the middle of night and everything things everything seems five times more dramatic. Like yeah. you're like, oh, I hear a baby crying. Oh, my goodness. OK, I got to get up. And then it just seems like the house is lonely. It's like quiet. It's those, I don't know. But one thing that did help me is I, I would always turn on friends mm-hmm. and I'd go downstairs. I know a lot of people know us in the bedroom because then they can just stay in bed. But I tried that a couple of times and I felt like I just kept wanting to fall asleep. Yeah. I wouldn't stay awake. And so it helped me to go downstairs and turn on turn on the lamp. And I, I'm one, though, that doesn't have a problem falling back to sleep. I know some people who, like, if you wake up, go downstairs, turn on the lamp, then you can't fall back to sleep. So you got to do what works for you. But for me, I'd go down there, turn on the lamp, and turn on Friends. And Friends was a lifesaver. Like, I turned that on every single night. And it was, around, it was about the same time, like, clockwork. That's a good tip. Because when I had Dean, I had the Christmas light. So I mm-hmm. would go north and by that. the Christmas light and it would just make me feel like cheerful and it would help me like, yeah, because like I said, sleep is one that was challenging for me, but it would make me feel like, oh, like, okay, I get to spend this, these moments, these quiet moments with Dean by the Christmas lights and stuff. But now it's past Christmas, our Christmas tree is down. So that's a good idea to turn on like, friends or hallmark or something like that or even a cooking show or something yeah Um, because i'm the same way as you i fall asleep very easily megan was making fun of me because we were talking about the (laughs) outline of the podcast and she's like yeah sleep is one that's hard for you because you would always fall asleep in the car on a road trip and everyone would always make fun of me because they would be like you're falling asleep and you're missing all on the scenery and the sights and stuff um 
But yeah, if I stay in bed and try to nurse, or if I sit on even the rocking chair, I'm going to definitely try like probably fall back asleep. Yeah. Well, and you can tell this is like <laughs> you're um, getting ready to go into this. So you're like thinking ahead and nervous. I'm not even close to like the next postpartum stage yet anyways. And so you can tell I'm getting a little baby fever because I'm thinking back to those memories and I'm like, I kind of miss that. Like, yeah, it was exhausting, but it was also really good bonding time. And um, since I did like tone on friends and stuff, it kind of, when I think about those memories, they're like not, I don't know, they're, they're not like really, I mean, they are hard, but like they're a good hard memory. Yeah. If that makes sense. That does. Because Dean tonight, I was, uh, um, I've been trying to like prep him and I was like, so we were praying and I was like, I just pray for a smooth transition with Dean and with Levi being born. And I just said the name on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess we'll see how many people listen to the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Hey, you already have the name up in the baby room, so yeah, yeah. people are gonna re—they're gonna go back and be like, rewind. What did she say? Yeah, what did she say it was? Um. Anyways, anywho, um, and um, so I was talking to Dean tonight about that, and I said, Dean, sometimes mommy's gonna have to like feed the baby, and I'm gonna have to carry the baby and take care of the baby, but that doesn't mean that mommy isn't gonna read to you or she's not gonna snuggle with you. She's still gonna do all those things. So. You might have to share mommy, but mommy, there's a lot of mommy to go around and Mm. I'm going to take care of both of you and you're both my babies. And he goes, mommy, I'm not a baby. I'm a big kid. And (laughs) mommy carry baby. Daddy can carry Dean. And I was like, no, mommy wants to carry you both. You're going to be on this (laughs) side. The baby's going to be on this side. And he goes, it's okay, mom. Daddy can carry me you can carry the baby. And I'm like, and then I was arguing with him. I'm like, no, you are my baby. And I'm going to carry you both. Oh my gosh. And, Dean. Then, him, and then I'm yeah. like, no. I love it when Dean says like, just stuff like that, like random, like <laughs> he's, he's too smart for his own good. I know. No, I mom. feel like he, he can like, you can like reason with him. And like, I feel like he grasps things and understands. And he's like, Mom, he goes, he goes like this, Mom, (laughs) if you're carrying the baby, you're not going to have two hands. You can't carry Dean and the baby. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) So I hope this, the transition goes as smooth as he is um, acting like it will. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it'll be tough. Like I'm sure moments will be tough, but then I'm sure there'll be really like sweet moments and um, you said you've been kind of doing some research on how to prep him and um, get him ready so that he doesn't feel like he's being replaced or anything like yeah. that. And I think having Andrew really helps because they spend so much time together. Like the other day he was like, I'm going to have two cousins. And I'm like, well, actually, he's going to be your brother. <laughs> yeah. Like he gets the concept of like, it's OK to have another one. And I think he still remembers like Andrew being little and going through like the crawling stages and I mean the memories are probably kind of fuzzy since he's so little but I feel like he grew up with Andrew being a baby so he's that's kind of like what he's known and he's just now starting to call Andrew big boy instead of baby Andrew yeah exactly um the next one we wanted to touch on is just postpartum bodies and if you guys want to check out the article I don't think we'll go into it very much just because it is pretty personable it's um a little bit more intimate but there's an article that's called um let me click on it it's about like uh from a husband's perspective so it's called a husband's perspective on a postpartum body and it actually is uh pretty biblical I feel like and it's from Charlie's I think is how you say it c-h-a-l-l-i-e-s is the website charlie's.com I read that and sent it to Morgan and I told her we don't have to like cover it. Um, But it is a good one if you guys want to check it out and just get some perspective, a new perspective than maybe what we sometimes hear about postpartum, postpartum bodies. Um, But one thing that I feel like we really try to like focus on when it comes to postpartum bodies is the fact of just feeling good and having 
some realistic expectations. And especially because we do focus on fitness and nutrition and we uh, try to go on walks and stretch and just like overall health that we're not necessarily focused on just what we look like. We want to have an overall well-being and positive health. Um, But it is hard sometimes to be like, okay, this is how I was before and this is how I am now and there's some changes. And so we just wanted to kind of talk about that a little bit and see how we were feeling and um, just kind of go from there. So Morgan, uh, how was that kind of different throughout like your first postpartum journey from when you had Dean to now? And then what do you think it'll be like with this one? It's um definitely been a journey because I feel like with Dean, my body, like from, for me personally and stuff, and like you said, nutrition and things like that, my body went back to like pretty quickly the the scale was similar to from when I had after I had him to when before I had him but then when I stopped breastfeeding and like when I was breastfeeding I really didn't honestly have to really watch what I was eating because I actually needed to consume more calories to keep up with milk supply so then when I was done breastfeeding I kind of continued to eat the same way and I actually the scale started to go back up and so when you're postpartum like that, the goal is that the scale stays the same mm-hmm. or goes down, right? Because yeah. theoretically, like you're the body, the baby weight. And so when it started going back up and some of the clothes that I had bought when I first um, lost the weight, then we're starting to feel a little snug. And so it was a mental game. And I know, Megan, you've talked about this too. It was kind of this mental game of like, it's okay. Like every season is different. And my body was actually kind of adjusting back to like, actually where it was before I was postpartum. And before I had Dean. And I also know that I was stressed out. I probably wasn't like really dialed in with my nutrition. I was still walking out and stuff. But sometimes as a mom and busy and walking like you're not like you might like I try to meal prep and I try to follow all the consistencies but sometimes I was throwing quicker meals into the oven not always having veggies at every meal and so like the more I sat down and looked at it I kind of realized like this trend of like maybe why it was um, going the way that it was and then now also the second pregnancy and comparing the two like I am bigger this time around the scales heavier than the first time with Dean which they say usually show faster um, they say your ribs actually move like four inches and then your pelvic like widens too. So your hips get wider. And so like knowing all those things, you might not fit back into the genes you had before you got pregnant. And so I think just being aware of that, uh, not letting the scale like determine your mood and things and more focusing on how you feel and making sure that you're staying consistent with personal self-care of health fitness exercise but not being so like consumed by it Mm -hmm. yeah well and I think too um it has a lot to do with your mindset like you said you kind of had a mindset game when you went from nursing to not nursing anymore and that's kind of where I've been in the last couple months um actually probably like the last half a year um and I do think it has your mindset plays a huge role in it I remember after having Andrew and being home the the first week being home and I remember telling Kyle like I'm actually really proud of like what my body did and I thought I would be disappointed with how I looked and I actually wasn't I was like you know what like yeah I haven't lost the baby weight yet and it's all loose and like it's not round anymore but and I had a C-section, so, like, I had my my scar and my wounds and everything. And I was like, you know what? I actually feel pretty good. I was like, I am happy with what I look like. And I look at some pictures now and think I was pretty in a good mindset then because some of the pictures look like I'm still pregnant. And I was a week postpartum. and But I told Kyle that I felt good. And now, two years later, it's funny how I'm still kind of playing that mindset game of, like, um 
my jeans aren't fitting because I've started to gain back up after nursing. And, and when I was nursing, I lost so many calories trying to keep up with my milk supply. So I felt like I lost the baby weight really fast, like you did. And so I bought new clothes and now those clothes are not fitting anymore. So it's a mindset game of, it's not that I feel bad in my skin. Like I feel confident in my skin. And I think that's the walk of what we've been doing with body and our, mm-hmm. our walkouts and our community group or not community group, but our um, fitness group what we've been doing with them over the last four or five years. And so I think mindset plays a huge role in it. And, but it's always a walk in progress. Like I'm still walking towards my mindset of um, feeling confident in this season of postpartum two years later. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you felt good right away after postpartum. And probably also because like, as you're finishing up, like the third trimester, getting close to having the baby, you feel really sore. You feel like inflamed, yeah. like my feet are swollen. I told Megan I can't wear my wedding ring anymore because <laughs> the last couple of weeks my hands have been super swollen. And so like when you do have the baby, you're probably just kind of like, phew, like my yeah. body did that. Um, And every pregnancy is going to be different. Like this time around, I told Tyler that I'm getting more stretch marks and stuff. And he's like, well, this is also the second time your body's done this. So like, that's pretty amazing that like, your body's like carrying a, a, a living being and like it kind of knows what to do already. And even though I am bigger this time, this this time around, like that probably is why I'm getting stretch marks is because it's just a different experience. He might be a bigger baby. Like we don't know, like the whole t- like the whole um, differences and things like that. And so it's just kind of also interesting, like you felt good right away. But then now you're kind of like, it's okay that you're two years now postpartum and kind of still like going through the emotions of like, yeah, body's changed and now it's kind of changed back and now it's changing again. Like there's these ebbs and flows and it's okay to like have that realization that just because it was one way at a certain point doesn't mean that your feelings and emotions aren't validated like even two years later and me oh, yeah. three years later. Yeah, for sure. We have, um, to wrap it up, we have a couple quick bites for exercise and pregnancy, and we have three myths to talk about. So myth number one is if you don't usually exercise, you shouldn't start enjoying pregnancy is what a lot of people think. And um, that is actually a myth because any kind of exercise, any time throughout your life is good. Like you never want to say, oh, I haven't been exercising, so it's probably not good to start. But they did say in the article that if you haven't been exercising, start with some lighter things like walking or yoga, Pilates, um, bar, just different things that riding a bicycle, different things that will ease you into it and just help you get some movement in. But any kind of exercise anytime throughout your life is good. And how sore you feel during that third trimester like sometimes laying down like the last couple of nights I've actually had to get up and walk around and movement helps move your joints and your, your aches and pains. And so like even doing cat cow and like stretching your back or putting your yeah. hands on your back and kind of stretching your rib cage out or like doing some side stretches, like all those things are going to help you feel more comfortable, even when you're super sore. Oh, so yeah. trying to walk those kinks out, like In the morning when I do my workout, I feel 10 times better than when I first crawled out of bed Mm -hmm. after I did my workout. Yeah. The second myth says athletes can continue vigorous exercises throughout pregnancy without cause for concern. And this is a myth because sometimes athletes or like people who have worked out their whole lives or do pretty vigorous exercises, they can um, feel like, and sometimes Meg and I are known for doing this, we can feel like oh we can do anything or we can we can even though we're pregnant like we can still do it and um but also like knowing your limits like we had a squat challenge at the school and instead of doing a hundred squats in that time frame that all the kids were doing it I spread mine out and did mine throughout the day because I knew it would be better for baby and for me to do like 10 at a time versus like trying to think I'm superhero and do a hundred at one time yeah um, definitely Myth number three says the only value of exercise during pregnancy is to help you lose weight more easily after your baby is born. And that is a myth because that shouldn't be the only goal. We want to 
we want to do exercise to help our cardio health, to help um, heart, lungs, to help our endurance. Even it will help like during labor and delivery. And it will help with recovery as well. Like not just losing weight, but recovery as in um, healing and just getting kind of feeling better, but it's going to help your overall health. It also helps your mental health. Um, we have less than a minute, so let's wrap this up, Morgan. But uh, we are thankful that you guys are here and excited that you are tuning into our February episode on postpartum. So thank you, everyone. Please share, like, and comment. Um, and we will still do it. Um, if I haven't been able to do the gift cards for the coffee, so if you leave a review and, and message us about that, I will get you a $5 gift card for um, coffee. So like, share, comment, and subscribe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.